Here we are, the big one. The 10th anniversary of Heisei Rider and the nearly 40th anniversary of Kamen Rider as a whole. We've had a minor 35th anniversary celebration with Kabuto, but that was mostly in name only, as all we got was the cast reacting to some old Showa era Rider clips. stronger, Nada. Ore strongest, toyu tokoroka. I love that. Obviously, 40 years is no small feat, and it kind of helped that we had a bit of a hiatus with Kamen Rider between Black RX and Kuga, with the only content being three movies and stage shows. While the Showa era went on longer than Heisei by the year 2009, it was a good time to look back at how far Toei's come from the original Karate Bugman. Give a TV show a decade and you'll see how much can change visually. Give it a few decades and you'll get... Decade. Take one look at the trailer, an all-out rider war against one single rider. Wataru from Kiva is here, we see Decade fighting Kuga, and there's even a glimpse of Ultimate Kuga with black eyes, something we never saw in the original season. There's no way Kamen Rider Decade could be disappointing. What are we waiting for? Let's dive in! Okay, first off, it is super hot in this room, and I can't see anything, so um, you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit. <laughs> In 2009, an organization called Shade was forced to disband after it was discovered they were doing unethical experiments. Their leader was captured, so Shade holds TV Asahi Studios hostage in exchange for the freedom of Shade's boss. A woman, Eddie, recognizes one of the soldiers as her fiancé, Goro, who disappeared three years ago. She has him try some wine, the one thing that's close to both of them. Goro remembers of his engagement and how he was one of many that was experimented on by Shade. Through the power of love, they escape and run into soldiers who transform into monster suits from past seasons, along with some reused music from Kabuto. Goro is thrown off a building, then prepares to transform. A battle against one of the monsters has him almost downed, until... <laughs> The writer who fights for love, Kamen Rider G. The Kamen Rider franchise wasn't the only thing with a big milestone, as it was also TV Asahi's 50th anniversary in broadcasting. TV Asahi teamed up with the boy band SMAP to make this fun little special to also promote Kamen Rider Decade. Which I think is a little strange considering G aired a little under a week after Decade already premiered, but I digress. Being unofficially official, G doesn't have to do with anything whatsoever and was only meant to be a fun little standalone special. In fact, Kamen Rider G himself is only referenced once until 2019. Twice if you want to count that a Neo Shade group exists in a later season, though they were mostly a throwaway line. Even still, I'm gonna have to go with a majority and say, yeah, I do wish Kamen Rider G had its own full-on season. The connection between Gordo and Erdi felt so real when we saw all those flashbacks. The suits look pretty, and a wine motif is unique. Imagine if we got like a soda secondary rider or original monster suits based on other drinks. There was bike action, great set pieces, and even the CG wasn't all that bad. Because the special is only 15 minutes. A lot was put into a short amount of time and it came out great. Big props to the team that was able to put all this together. Actually, I'm interested in seeing who the writer is. I want to thank them especially for writing... Shoji Yonemura? Back in Hibiki, I explained that its second half had changes in its production team due to low toy sales. I mostly pointed a finger towards Toshiki Inui, but I also stated that Shoji Inomura also had some fingerprints on the show as well. He wrote two of what I personally think were a couple of the lowest points in Hibiki. However, he was also the head writer for Kamen Rider Kabuto, a season that I think has some pretty great writing, even if its second half kind of dropped in quality just a bit. He has some writing credits in Deno, Kiva, and is more known within the fan base for writing the superhero Tyson movies. We won't get to those until Forze, so for now I'll just say that they're not looked upon very fondly. At least in terms of writing. His track record has been back and forth, though if asked I'm gonna have to say it's more on the negative side. Since I'm talking about him so much, you know he'll be brought up again, and man do I have something to say about the writing when we get to it. But we haven't even gone to episode 1 of Kamen Rider Decade. Trust me guys, there's gonna be a lot to unpack, as there's a lot of behind the scenes information that, well you'll see. <laughs> Remember how in the trailer for Decade we saw the Rider War? 
That's how the show starts, along with a girl in a white dress in the middle of it. A swarm of riot troopers, explosions, the den liner blowing up, and a figure who the girl calls... Decado. Her name is Natsumi, and she woke up from a dream. I think we're good as long as we don't get a season called Kamen Rider Super Decade. She lives with her grandpa at the Hikari Photo Studio, although there's an angry mob not liking how their pictures came out. These are due to Sukasa Kadoya, a man who just appeared out of nowhere and started using Hikari Studio as his agency, much to Natsumi's dismay. To keep him in check, Natsumi uses her family's laughing pressure point technique. <laughs> Sukasa's photos are coming out weirdly because he doesn't belong to this world. Or so he says. He may be right, because the world around them starts dissolving, when Wataru shows up to tell Sukasa about the world's falling apart. I'm not surprised Wataru is here in a meta sense, as filming of the next season typically starts a bit before the previous season ends. So Wataru was still available before his actor got too big to pay out the ham sandwich that Toei likes to give. Wataru explains that there are worlds with stories independent from other writers. In other words, a multiverse. Sukasa's mission is to travel to each of these worlds and destroy their common writers, for without destruction, there is no creation. Can I just say how genius that premise is? Aside from very minor early references in Agito to Kuga, Heisei Rider seasons in Phase 1 have been standalone and don't really connect whatsoever. I mean, if they did, then the entire world would be traumatized after the events of Blade. If you watched other toku like Super Sentai and Power Rangers, then you're used to how seasons are standalone with little crossover, excluding the anniversary seasons and team-ups. Although people like me do like continuity, I prefer if the writers were together, but as I stated, there is a multiverse now. We're here in Kamen Rider's anniversary season. I think it was a brilliant idea to confirm that this all does take place in a multiverse. Wataru brings up that his comrades will keep this world safe while Tsukasa is on his journey. That could mean Wataru's friends in the Aozora organization like Iksa, but as we'll see later, he most likely means the writers we know from past seasons like Blade. While we have a multiverse, we can also assume that the seasons we've seen thus far are at least connected in the same way that Sentai and Ranger seasons are, mostly separate but have crossover. This way we can enjoy past seasons and even have room for things like fan-made OCs, novelizations, future movies, retcons, Kamen Rider G, and anything Toei sees fit to be in the Heisei Phase 1 universe, including new writers for those past seasons. Oh, right. Natsumi and other civilians have been running away from monsters like Fangires and Imogen, when Natsumi stumbles across a belt and car holder under some rubble. Tsukasa yells out to her, but a worm appears to mimic Natsumi. He takes the belt and transforms into our 10th primary rider, Kamen Rider Decade. Henshin! Kamen Rider Decade! Don't call him pink, he's magenta. But as a guy with slight color blindness, I'm gonna say pink anyway. Deno was already a bit of a departure from rider suit designs and Decade goes right alongside it. Really, compare them to anything from the Showa era and you'll see one of the few similarities are the buggy compound eyes. Decade himself looks very nice, with a barcode motif for the helmet and a stylized X for the chest. The design is clean. I personally don't think that the color is too much of a standout, but it's still good to look at. Since the monster that mimicked Natsumi was a worm, who better than to fight one than Kabuto? That's right, Decade has the ability to transform into legend riders and that's awesome. They even keep the Decade driver during the transformation. Speaking of which, I love the henshin device this season. Phase 1 belts have been simple and that definitely isn't a bad thing. They're all very sleek and I think one of the best of the Decade driver. From experience, it's fun to open and insert the cards. I want to say that it looks futuristic and modern at the same time. I know that sounds weird, but I don't know. Decade also has the right booker, a holder for the cards, which can turn into a sword. That's a bit inconvenient since Decade needs to take a few seconds to insert a card to change the booker into the sword in the first place, but I digress. Sukasa has his mission and Natsumi decides to go with him because he basically needs a babysitter at this point. They go back to the photo studio when her grandpa accidentally pulls down a backdrop, revealing a city. I'm not really sure how this works, but I'm not losing any sleep over it. If anything, it just adds to the intrigue of the show. 
Our group is tasked to travel through different worlds and destroy the writers. We already saw Watru, so maybe we'll get to see more returning actors. I know a lot of them are off onto other things outside of Kamen Rider, and some aren't even allowed back due to blacklisting on their agencies not wanting them back. But this is Toei, they can pull miracles. Right? Sukasa steps outside, now in an officer uniform, and gets a radio call about an unidentified life form. The police are fighting off these unidentified life forms when a man named Yusuke transforms into Kamen Rider Kuga. <laughs> I'm not mad, nor am I disappointed. In fact, I really don't mind. I said earlier that I like how Decade is using a multiverse. A lot of previous actors couldn't come back for one reason or another, and the same goes with even the supporting cast. So what better way to have a multiverse than to just have alternate stories? These universes in Kamen Rider are known as AR worlds. I have seen this to mean another writer's world and alternate reality worlds. More so the latter ever since the next anniversary season uses the word another, and it might have gotten confusing if we kept saying another writer. Whichever you prefer. Alternate reality, another writer's world, I will just say AR, they're gonna mean the same thing. I'll get more on the AR world as a whole in a bit, cause right now we gotta meet Kuga. Not Yusuke Godai, but Yusuke Onodera. If you think it's tough to fill the shoes of Joe Odegiri, you're right, and Onodera's actor thought the same thing. You can already hear the comments, This isn't Godai, Onodera is the worst Kuga. What I have to say is, well duh. This isn't supposed to be Godai, it's a different man with the same ability to be Kuga. And hey, he did his best. After all, Onodera's actor binged the original Kuga season in three days, and he was even in Kamen Rider before. Right here. <laughs> and now he's a Kamen Rider. Maybe my theory of him being Hajime's son might come true. What's next? He goes to Sentai. Oh. For each world traveled, Tsukasa is given clothing to match the place he's in, and to give him a push towards what he's supposed to do, what role he's supposed to play. For example, the original Kuga worked together with the police, so Tsukasa is in an officer uniform to blend in. Now that we're in the world of Kuga, what do we do? We learn that Yusuke has some interest in another officer named Ane, and asks if she saw his henshin. <laughs> Sorry. After Yusuke's fight with the unidentified life form, he and Ane go to the photo studio, thinking that it used to be a cafe. Okay, that raises a lot of questions. Does the photo studio just replace a previous building? People clearly still remember what was there before, though maybe that isn't as weird as people not questioning dimensional travel. Then then why- uh, or okay, <sighs> let, let, let's save that for never, probably. The police are investigating the Grongi, so Tsukasa waltzes in acting like he already got the gist of things, and he can somehow speak the Grongi language. And he already knows a lot about other writers too. Hmm. Tsukasa figured out that the Grongi are playing a Gegaru to lure out the ultimate darkness, which isn't Dagava in this world, so I'll just let your disappointment settle there. Yusuke recognizes Decade as he was told that the devil would appear in his world. The two fight while a man in a brown coat watches them, saying that Decade shouldn't be here. He summons the Hell Brothers, Punch and Kick Hopper, to fight Tsukasa. Oh hey, the original actors return to voice all three lines. Then they leave. Just like that. We do get a flashback to when Yusuke first got his henshin belt, and of the man in the coat warning him about Decade, which means Yusuke wasn't fighting for long when Tsukasa arrived. Ane and the police investigate a mountain where the ultimate Grongi awakens, and they get attacked so Ane is sent to the hospital. Yusuke rushes to her side, which is where he learns that he wanted to fight to see her smile. But then she tells him that he should fight for other smiles too. Alone with Natsumi, Ani tells her that she only saw Yusuke as a little brother, and wanted to give him the push to save everyone but her. The ultimate Grongi summons more of his minions when Tsukasa arrives, giving a speech about how Yusuke is going to protect people's smiles, so Tsukasa will protect Yusuke's. Sukasa lost the ability to transform into past riders after his debut as Decade, but now that he completed his role in this world, he receives access to the Kuga cards. A final form ride card allows Kuga to turn into Goram, a beetle-like horse armor from the original season. I don't even want to begin to imagine how that works. 
After the battle, Tsukasa and Natsumi play around in the photo studio. Her grandpa notices that Tsukasa took a pretty good picture and is about to frame it, but accidentally reveals the next backdrop, one with a dragon inside a building. Meanwhile, Yusuke remembers Ane's final words about protecting people's smiles. He rides off as a small white bat follows. Alright, let's break this down. First off, I just condensed down three episodes for that recap. As always, I leave out the smaller details so you can enjoy the show and have some surprises that I didn't bring up. However, there aren't too many details to talk about, in my opinion. I had a couple comments on History of Kiva saying that I left out too much and just zoomed through everything. Aside from details, I bring up the bigger plot points as well as anything I think you should know to keep the story coherent. If I left out anything you think is important, then I personally thought the general story could be told without it. For example, when Tsukasa entered the police meeting, he brought up a theory about the Grongi wanting to kill female officers whose names spelled out something. It turned out he made it up so he could stop the Grongi's real plan. I really didn't feel the need to bring that up to tell the gist of things. I will say that it helped show us the type of guy Tsukasa is, being able to think one step ahead even in front of the police, but more on his personality later. So what's the point I'm getting at? If I'm able to condense three episodes down to this, leaving in only what I think is worth talking about, then I personally feel like something is... off. Not just with the show, but with me as a viewer. As in, I'm not really sure if that's a good or bad thing. Although, there's a lot more I can say outside the story, so let's get to that second here. What most people will point out is, to put it simply, they ruined Kuga. Can I just say that one thing which really annoys me is when people say, Blank is ruined. Guess what? The original Kuga still exists. The creation of an alternate reality does not erase the enjoyment you had with previous seasons. In fact, you could even ignore the AR worlds and deck it entirely. Yusuke Onodera is not Yusuke Godai. They're different people. Even if this is a different world, I'd believe there would be some parallels or at least some similar themes to the originals. Even Spider-Man from different dimensions learned that with great power comes great responsibility. So another Kuga would learn to protect people's smiles. That's actually something I like about Onodera. I can't stress enough that he's a completely different person, so he'd have a different journey than Godai. You see, Onodera was pretty cocky at first, and even a bit selfish. It took Ane's death to establish his goal. His characterization doesn't stop there either. He continues to get development in future arcs and stays true to his words of making people smile. He's not whiny about it. Onodera learns to not be so cocky and tries his best. I mean, obviously he's no Godai, but that's not a fair comparison. Onodera has the mantle of Kuga and will continue to fight to see smiles. On that end, Tsukasa is just awesome. He isn't the traditional protagonist, as he's very cocky with a lot of sarcasm. And yet, he does the right thing. Keep that in mind as we continue traveling through the worlds. Well actually, that's something I was dreading when I got to History of Decade. I'll put it very bluntly. <laughs> At the very least, there isn't an overarching story, just the general plot that Decade must quote-unquote destroy each world. I could say that Decade is one of, if not the most episodic season in the Heisei era. Which brings me to say, I won't be going in-depth on every single arc or world in this season. That might disappoint some of you, but I'll at least talk about certain aspects. Besides, if you wanted a recap of every arc, then you might as well read the Kamen Rider wiki. Although I absolutely don't like going on there and haven't for a video since... History of Ryuki 1.0? Man, it's been that long. I'll explain why I don't go on the wiki some other time since we got a lot to go through. You know the old saying, it's the journey, not the destination, and what I always say, your opinion matters more than mine. I've had several very differing opinions, and some might be surprising. As much as I talked about being positive towards Onodera and his growth, I actually found the world of Kuga arc kind of boring. Don't get me wrong, the action is quite good, I'd even say a bit better than previous seasons, 
The choreography is a lot of fun, and the CGI is reserved mostly for the finishers and final attack rides. It's more the moment to moment points that I found pretty boring. When the Hell Brothers showed up, that was cool. They fought for a couple moments, then it's back to... in investigating, I guess. Sukasa having these plans is great for his character, but I felt like fast forwarding through those explanations. This feeling even went to the next arc, the world of Kiva. Its user is a kid who is having conflict on becoming the Fangire King. Interesting idea, but again, nothing else grabbed me to keep me invested. Yusuke establishes his character more when he tells Wataru that he wants to protect him and take him wherever he wants. Then after some events, a distressed Wataru begs Yusuke to take him anywhere as long as it's far away. But Yusuke wants to help Wataru with his problem, rather than escape it. That was good. Both Yusuke and Wataru grew. Though it was a single moment from two episodes. Oh <laughs> look, it's the puppet guy from Kiva. To bring up some important points, the white bat is named Kivala, and the man in the brown coat is Narutaki. Now who are they exactly and what do they do? Excellent questions. Then Yusuke and Kivala decide to join Sakasa on his journey. Now here comes my biggest critique about Decade. It has such interesting ideas, but I feel like they're not used to their fullest potential. Or at least in a way that matters. Kiva's world has Fangire and humans coexisting. If a Fangire attacks a human, then they get executed. I kinda wish that was in the original Kiva, but we see it happen in this arc once. Okay then. The next arc, World of Ryuki. It has a law system where 13 writers fight for a verdict, and the last one standing decides the fate of the defendant. Natsumi is implicated for murder, and then... Eh? I noted earlier that a multiverse means that Toei is free to add new elements to past seasons, including new writers. Our first new writer for a previous season is Kamen Rider Abyss. <laughs> Something about the design feels off from the other Ryuki writers, but I do like it. The shark motif is cool and I like the shade of blue. What I find more interesting is that its user turns out to be an undead from Blade. Wow, something from one season appears in another? Like the worlds really are colliding and going out of balance. They don't really do this again until the end, by the way. Don't even get me started on Kamen Rider Salary Man, or um, Blades World. It's a restaurant that uses card suits as a tier system, and the writers are at the top, who also have to be authorized in order to transform. The Kazuma from this Blade World goes down ranks, and Tsukasa works his way to the top. Although I don't think it really mattered to the overall story. Hey, at least Kazuma references how the original Blade had a slur in his speech. That's... cute. World of Fies. Smart Brain has a school and the Lucky Clover are a snobby high school clique. Alright. Look, the ideas are great, and dare I say, more interesting than the originals. But the originals had great stories and characters. Here, the ideas are superfluous. Sure, having writers fight as lawyers is cool, but take that out and the story can be told perfectly fine without it. The ranking system for Blade's restaurant can make for a lot of cool interactions, but that world's writers are really boring, so what does it matter to me if Kazuma becomes a dishwasher? Here's the thing. The show is still a lot of fun. Yeah, the justice system in Ryuki's world didn't impact the story, but dang, was it fun to see the writers fight it out and yell at each other why they think the defendant is guilty or innocent? It was fun to see Sakasa banter and say that Natsumi finally did it, huh? <laughs> Even AR Ryuki and Knight had some intriguing backstories. The world building has so much more than I was expecting. Odin's time vent cards exist in that world. They're illegal to use and whoever activates them gets disqualified from the trial. Wow, that's... I, I don't even know, I just really like that. In Kiva's world, Tsukasa tries to protect a human that was being chased by a Fangire. But Tsukasa wasn't a wrong this time because it turns out the human really was a Fangire who broke the law by killing another human. Our main protagonist was wrong? When Kazuma got ranked down to the lowest tier, Tsukasa stood up for him in his Tsukasa way, and allowed Kazuma to start back from the kitchen. I didn't care about Kazuma being a dishwasher, I cared that Tsukasa cared. And when Chalice's identity was revealed, I won't dare to spoil that. Although its user had a master plan that was 
kind of dumb, but the whole plot point with Chalice had me wondering what was going to happen with him. By the way, Blade's final attack ride had him turn into a blade. Please tell me that's not stupidly fun. Probably the most superfluous idea is Fiza's world where Smart Brain has a high school. The setting could have been almost literally anywhere else and it wouldn't have made a difference. One detail I like is that since these are AR worlds, we don't know who the faces underneath the writers are. They may keep the first name, but the last names are different. So there are a couple times where we're only given the last names of these characters until it's time to reveal the primary writer. We're introduced to a young boy named Ogami in Smart Brain High School. When his friend gets attacked, she calls out to him as Takumi. Then it's shown that he's Fiza's user. I mean, it's super obvious who the users are going to be, but it's fun to go along with the reveal. At the same time of these events, another man watches from the shadows. He's appeared in Blade's world and once asked if Sukasa has tried Sea Cucumber. Narutaki seems to be afraid of this man and leaves the moment he sees him. His name is Daiki Kaito and he apparently knew Sukasa a long time ago. Kaito is a thief after the world's treasures, including the Fize gear. When Sukasa fights off some Orphanox, Kaito makes his debut. He pulls out a cyan-colored gun and... Common Rider D End. He can't transform into other riders, but he can summon them. Wanna guess what's the opposite color of magenta? I really like the design for D End. It's similar to Decade, yet has enough shape differences. Not to mention that we have a rider that transforms with a gun and not a belt. Hope you like that, because Kaito is just as mysterious as Nartaki and Kivala. Who is Kaito exactly and what does he do? More excellent questions. Agito Arc Deno Arc. It's an advertisement for the movie. Here's the meme because I know you all want to see it. Cho <laughs> Deno Movie Onigashima Warship. Sakasa and crew are in there for a couple minutes. Kabuto Arc. Oh, another interesting idea. This world's Kabuto is stuck in Clock Up, and the story is actually as interesting this time too? Okay, now I really want to talk about this. Sukasa plays the role of a Zek Trooper in this world, where he comes across a worm that's mimicking him. <laughs> they come across a girl and her grandmother in a restaurant. The girl's brother was killed by Kabuto a long time ago but it turns out that her brother has been secretly working for Zek without his family knowing. He created a machine to stop Kabuto's clock up, so we see that this Kabuto is the real brother and the other is just a worm. Despite me saying that the Agito and Dano arc exists, I did enjoy them. Agito's arc specifically gave Yusuke more development, which is always a plus to me. The Kabuto arc, however, is where I really felt invested in not only the characters, but the story. This arc respected its characters and even the themes that the original Kabuto had. It did something that the original couldn't, in that it showed us what if the protagonist couldn't leave Clock Up. What would happen? The action was specifically great in this arc. The villain plans were a joy to sit through. Grandma being here and giving the words of wisdom in person makes me cheerful on the inside. Sukasa and friends push the story in the right direction without being an abstraction to the AR world. In fact, when I watched through this arc in the middle of the night, I said to myself, This is it. This is the Kamen Rider decade I wanted. <laughs> and then we get to the Hibiki arc, the final of the phase one worlds for decade to destroy. Here I thought that Hibiki was saved for last because Toei didn't want to deal with it but was obligated to respect the legacy, and wait, the main Hibiki writers and their disciples return? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll try not to fanboy. But look, this world has something new where each writer has a school to train their disciples and they have a rivalry. When the writers transform, their students have banners like how Shinkenger did. That's awesome. Oh, but the original Hibiki and Asumu couldn't return, so they probably just pushed the AR stuff to the side? No? AR Hibiki is actually lazy and Asumu is the one pushing him to be the Oni he's meant to be. The complete opposite of the original Hibiki. I... 
like that a lot actually. This Hibiki is only lazy and hesitant to transform because he has a secret. The other schools are always conflicting so AR Todoroki and Akira have this Romeo and Juliet thing where they want to be together and try to unify the schools. And it's Kaito who's giving them the push they need to work together. This is Decade. I haven't officially said it yet through History of Kamen Rider and I've been asked a lot to do so, so I'll say it now. My favorite Kamen Rider season is Hibiki, so you'd probably expect me to absolutely despise Decade's version. But no, Hibiki's arc is really well done and I love basically everything about it. Much like Kabuto, it respected the characters of this world and even a bit of the originals. The story seemed like it really could have been a close counterpart to what we had before. And to top it all off, there is this beautiful scene of the writers and their disciples coming together for one big musical ending. This is Decade. And this is also Hibiki. <sighs> It's unfortunate that I felt the most invested in the final two arcs, but at least they were a great send-off for Decade. Well, that was a short season, but hey, I enjoyed it. With all that being said, I'll... Oh, oh, th there's more? Kamen Rider Decade, soon. Kamen Rider Decade was a trip and a half. I watched it at the same time as Gio, and although that is possibly the most confusing way to experience both of these shows, I am happy that I took the journey. In a bizarre way, it helped me understand both shows a bit better, and it made it 10 times more fun because I recognized some of the cameos. As everyone stated before, the first half is very strong. It establishes characters incredibly well, especially our leads which is a huge reason why I ended up enjoying Decade as much as I did. When it comes to Toku, what I care about most is the acting. If a show has terrible acting, I drop it in an instant. But if there is at least one or two actors that completely blow me out of the water or surprise me, I am hooked. And the MVP, of course, is Masahiro Inoue as our leading man, Tsukasa Kadoya, Kamen Rider Decade. I haven't been this floored by a toku actor since Mahiro Takasugi in Gaim and Taiki Yamazaki in Q-Ranger. They're top tier actors in my book. This dude, though, is a honey badger. He knows he's strong and he completely owns it. I have never seen a protagonist like him before and I didn't know how badly I needed this in my life till Tsukasa came along. The closest comparison I can think of is Lelouch Lamperouge from Code Geass. Both of them do all of these self-sacrificing things for the greater good, even at the cost of coming off as evil to the rest of the cast, but in reality, he just takes all of the burdens onto himself. And despite all of this, he does have a heart of gold, and he protects those who need it and shows tough love to teach others lessons that help them resolve their problems. He even helps out his rivals. Kamen Rider DN went from foe to ally by the end, and it was honestly one of the most satisfying endings I've seen for two characters in a long time. My fondest memory is figuring out that I had seen Yusuke's actor before in Lord Moonstone's toku parody of Fuma no Koji and I just ended up nicknaming him Kieran the rest of the time. The second half, like most of the fandom, left me confused because we never found out what was Narutaki's deal. He was just standing around ominously giving omens throughout the show, but we didn't know why. That's my only gripe with the show. I think Decade was a completely solid show, and I would love to rewatch it over and over again. I gained so much respect for this cast, and I believe I will always have a special place for Decade in my heart for years to come. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the gist of it. Yeah, the journey isn't over yet. All Sukasa had to do was travel to the world of the writers. So why is he traveling in other worlds now? You're full of excellent questions. We return back to where we first started, Natsumi's world. Everything seems fine so far, she hangs out with her friends, Tsukasa appears to be having a good day since he's giving a free meal and he has a marriage interview. Gosumiya. 
and Otoya Kurenai. Wait, what? Of course it's too good to be true. This isn't Natsumi's world, it's the world of negatives. Otoya has been trying to convince Tsukasa to stay in this world and be its ruler. As explained in the show, photographs have negatives, and that's what we're seeing here. Dark Riders control the world as Natsumi's opposite and other humans try to survive by hiding. The Dark Riders are going after the other Natsumi because she's hiding a treasure. A treasure which allows Tsukasa to get a Saishu power-up for the season. Kuga, Agito, Yuki, Fai, Lei, Kamen Rider Decade Complete. Um, I like the silver? Honestly, if it wasn't for the gaudy cards in the chest, I would like this suit way more. What I do find cool is that Tsukasa can summon riders in their powered up forms and have them copy his every move. After this fight, Otoya leaves. Yeah, that's it. We never see him out of suit again. Ever. The next arc has us journey to Dien's world, where the actors for the Blade movie riders return for some reason? A.R. Conrader Glaive is Kaito's brother, named Junichi Kaito. Although the original was Junichi Shimoda... What, what, what the f- Oh hey, you guys are probably waiting for this one. Kamen Rider finally has a true crossover with Super Sentai, and a Chain Kenger. Black and Black RX arc, Kotaro Miname returns. That's cool. And Apollo Geist from Kamen Rider X is now the big bat of the season. The hell? Next arc, World of Amazon. Why? Amazon! Why? Movie time, all riders versus Die Shocker. Tsukasa and crew are in a new world. And it seems to belong to Tsukasa as his worlds aren't turning out like they were before. He finds a key in his coat, which leads him to a house where he sees a girl playing a piano. She calls him... Big Brother. Yeah, now we get some of Tsukasa's backstory. His sister is named Sayo. Their parents died years ago, so they were being taken care of by a butler named Tsukikage. Sayo has the ability to see other worlds, but can't go to them. Tsukasa was able to and often left her behind while he went on his journeys. Tsukasa left one year ago on another journey and never returned. Tsukikage explains that Tsukasa is acting as a bridge between all the worlds he's visited, and the only way to stop the worlds from colliding is for there to only be one rider standing. One tournament later, it's revealed that Tsukasa was experimented on and became the leader of Dai Shocker. Now he's taken back his throne. That does explain a few things, such as how he knows to speak Grongi and how he has knowledge on other riders. As the leader of this evil giant organization, he'd need to have a lot of info on his enemies. It's also where the Deca Driver and Dien Gun came from. It's the classic Ichigo route, and I think that's a good way to insert a throwback while making its own character. Oh, and Tsukikage is Shadow Moon. Okay then. He states that the riders have nothing to do with the worlds colliding. Now that they're wiped out except for Tsukasa, they have no use for him and throw him out for the true heir of the throne, Sayo. In a defining moment for their characters, Tsukasa goes back to the photo studio, begging Natsumi to let him in. But this time, she says no. He really messed up, throwing out his friends just for a seat in the group of villains. I wish we got to see more of Tsukasa as the shocker leader since we never had a protagonist take the role as the antagonist before. Not like this. With nowhere else to go, and with Shocker taking over the city, Tsukasa sits by rubble, only to be greeted by A.R. Rider Man, who was tortured by Tsukasa a long time ago, and he's played by Gat? Not a fan. Through the power of getting over his self-deprecation, Tsukasa returns to his old self and gets help from the original riders. What are we, some kind of all riders versus die shocker, super cool giant rider kick, and obligatory cameos. Oh, what's this? I'm a bit conflicted with this movie. On one hand, I like that it gave us a lot of answers about Tsukasa specifically. On the other hand, why in the movie and not the season itself? Films in Heisei Phase 1 are generally glorified episodes, and that's not a bad thing. Action and a story on a bigger budget is good. Keep doing that. But here it feels... wrong. Almost like being invested in the story of a video game, only to find out that the most important parts are paid on-disc DLC. 
At least Dano was blatant that you absolutely had to watch the movie to progress the story. Here it feels like I'm being punished for wanting to know more about Tsukasa. That aside, I did actually like the plot, though once again, the ideas just come and go. Tsukasa has family that we could learn about. Vaguely, Sayo can see other worlds. Alright, Tsukasa is the leader of Die Shocker. For about 5 minutes, Natsumi's grandfather is actually Professor Shinigami? Except not really. At least the writer tournament was cool and wasn't just skimmed over. All in all, I wouldn't say All Riders vs. Die Shocker is a bad Kamen Rider movie, just odd for the lack of a better word. It's odd that arguably some of the biggest answers are put into the movie, rather than making it more impactful within the show. We're actually almost done with the season. Our final arc begins with Yusuke, Natsumi, and Tsukasa entering the world of the Rider War. AR Riders fighting for their own will to exist, several are killed off, Worlds are colliding, and Apollo Geist is accelerating the process. He plans to marry the Fangire Queen, played once again by the original actress. Although the character has a different name, it's the same face playing a previous role she had. Why not just say it's alternate reality Mio? That's basically what they did for Kenzaki- Oh, hi. Wait, what? Final episode, Destroyer of Worlds. After the Fangire Queen is defeated, Apollo Geist takes Natsumi to be his replacement bride. He has her chained up wearing a white dress, when Tsukasa arrives to rescue her. Though he's not alone, Tsukasa has his friends, Kaito and Yusuke by his side, as well as a couple of the AR writers. They defeat Apollo Geist, then Natsumi smiles, but her expression changes to being horrified. This is the place from her dream, and she's wearing the white dress. The original Wataru's last words to Tsukasa is that he made a mistake in not destroying the worlds. Now the writers will destroy him. And that's it. In a brilliant move by Toei, Kamen Rider Decade ends in a cliffhanger. If you couldn't tell, that was sarcasm. Not only is the real ending in a movie, it's in a crossover movie with the next season, Kamen Rider Double. I won't be covering Double's portion here since that wouldn't make sense. I'll cover it in History of Double where it belongs. Actually, I can barely talk about Decade's part at all. What do you want me to say about the last story? Decade gets really mad so his helmet becomes what's called Violent Emotion Decade, who's able to defeat Black Eyed Ultimate Kuga despite it being able to destroy the entire planet with a single punch. So Natsumi becomes Conrader Kivala and Tsukasa willingly lets her kill him. I guess we gotta redeem him so by the power of people's memories and possibly Snickers, Tsukasa calms down and returns to defeat Shocker with the help of Double. Tsukasa, Natsume, Yusuke, and Kaito look towards the next backdrop of an endless road, meaning they'll continue their journey. F*** this movie. Oh, and thanks for subbing this amazing series, TV Nihon. Hi there, my name's Phoebe, and I will be your special guest for the segment. Decade, what do those eyes see that go through the Nine Worlds? I can tell you what I see mix up of a lot of things that did work and didn't especially the story the story was really confusing there was not a lot of things that got explained what i really disliked was mainly how the ending was nothing went went as planned at all as i heard there were a lot of things wrong in the production but what did come out the whole journey throughout the to the ending was actually pretty pretty okay i say like the ar worlds aren't as bad as people say they are actually kiva was a really good one hibiki as well i like the show i really do it was a lot of fun even if there were a lot of things wrong with it i'm gonna stop my rambling in actually pretty good produced video now to show uh follow my twitter please bye i want your radar is natsumi to step on me we got a lot to talk about don't we Let's start with the characters. Really, what carried the show for me was the main cast. I absolutely adore Tsukasa being more of a sarcastic anti-hero, along with Yusuke and Natsumi being there as the friends he needs. Natsumi especially to keep him in check, and well, I think she's cute. I already said what I needed to about Yusuke, and Kaito was cool. I mean, how do you explain cool? I 
What the heck? A anyway. You can just tell that the actors were having the time of their lives. Quite literally was Tsukasa's actor, Masahiro Inoue, as he loves his role and comes back when he can. All Riders vs. Die Shocker had net movies which showcased the cast, well, being themselves. <laughs> We learned some trivia about writers, their actors, and a bit more behind the scenes. It's officially from Toei, so you can't exactly dispute this. It's also where they confirmed, from the source, that Fize is based on a shark and Kiva is based on a jack-o'-lantern. Look at Ichigo gallantly riding on a horse. Oh jeez, I didn't know the slits and rider helmets were so thin. How can you even see out of that? Dang, the suits really are heavy. These net movies are just fantastic in general, and they're really funny. Hey, it's a decade musical. I could watch this all day. I find it weird that Narutaki literally only says Onore Dikato once in the whole season. But it's become such a meme that he says it more in the net movies. Wait, what's the point of Narutaki again? No, seriously, who is he? We never learn who he is. Ever. I like him anyway. Onore Dikato and all. He's not the only unanswered question I have. What was the deal with Kaito and the sea cucumber thing? We're told that he and Tsukasa knew each other a while ago, but we don't know what that has to do with sea cucumbers. I'm not sure how true this is, though it's the only explanation I found. Apparently, that was an inside joke between the staff that worked on the season. Okay, mind cluing us in on it? This is why you don't just add pointless gags only a few people would get especially if it's for a show that's going to be watched by the world. It's confusing and adds unneeded lore to an already mess of a show. <sighs> Sorry, I got sidetracked. I should probably talk about the AR writers too. I'd like to restate that nothing of Decade quote-unquote ruined past seasons. There are alternate realities that allow for new characters to have old powers in a different story. Most of the AR writers were alright. None of them could ever match up to the originals, and they're not supposed to. AR Ryuki had a good mystery. AR Blade gave us some fan service with the Ondoro language. AR Agito connected with Kuga more than the original did. Dano were the originals. How odd. And Kenzaki Kazuma, what was the deal with him? An official Kamen Rider photo book released in 2015 stated that it was an AR Kenzaki. Same face, same powers, possibly same story just from a different world than the one we know. However, the writer for the arc he appeared in said that it was the original Kenzaki, the one we watched from Blade back in 2004-2005. I personally prefer if it was an AR Kenzaki strictly because he acted way out of character. Though that does bring up a theory. Was the Wataru from episode 1 the original Wataru? Or is it a similar situation where he's actually from another world? just similar to the Wataru we watched right before Decade. If this is a multiverse, then it's entirely possible that we have AR versions of the originals too. It's something to think about, and a theory I really like. At this point, you're probably wondering when I'm gonna bring up the music, outside the musical. Um, let's start with the insert themes. Once again, an insert theme is sung by the writer's actor. The instrumental is fantastic. The Spanish guitar, those pounding drums, this riff. Which is used a lot in the OST. I don't think the vocals are all that great, but I love Ride the Wind anyway. A long time ago, I put Treasure Sniper as the top song on my countdown for favorite intro themes. Yeah, it's still there. I still really love this theme. The perfect song for a thief like Kaito. Now here's where my controversial thought comes in. Journey Through the Decade is considered one of the best Kamen Rider themes of all time. It's sung by Gact, who's a ginormous celebrity in Japan, so getting him to sing an opening for Rider was cool. I've even heard of Gact before I started watching Rider. Now he's here, singing the theme which I don't like. Honestly, I'm not even sure what it is that I just don't enjoy about it. I tended to skip the theme a majority of the time, wishing that Ride the Wind was the opening. 
hey, that's just me. Like I said, this song is a fan favorite, and that's good. Just not my thing. What I do enjoy are the other songs sung by Gact. I'm in love with that guitar and chorus. The next decade is so awesome. Now this is Decade. A song about continuing the journey as long as we're connected. The orchestra feels so powerful, and Gag's vocals demand that you listen in. Stay the Ride Alive is one of my favorite movie themes, I just can't get enough. The perfect song to end off our journey and continue to the next. Thank you. Hmm. I stand corrected. Decade's music is generally really good. And not just the insert themes. Final Attack Ride Hibiki is awesome. The Henshin music is iconic. All the other musical cues like soft guitars, it's amazing. Now we gotta get back to what you guys are hoping for me to bring up. As you can tell, Decade isn't very coherent. And there's an explanation for that. Sukasa and crew being thrown into other worlds was the basic plot I needed. Whether the stories for those worlds actually worked was hit or miss. What I, and most likely you, are more interested in is, well, what happened that caused Decade to be this way? The season's head writer was Shoa Kaiwa, who was the main writer for Blade's later half. I praise that part of Blade and I praise the later writer arcs of Decade, but I could tell there was a difference in the writing for Decade. Aikawa left after the Agito arc due to creative differences with the producer, so several writers, including Toshike Inoue, Yasuko Kobayashi, and Kenji Konuta were brought in to fill in for other arcs. Normally, you'd have a team of writers, so having several isn't unheard of. But here, you can really tell that the quality is all over the place. There was one writer who didn't even write for the series before. Wow, that's... not... good. Then we go back to Shoji Yonemura. He wrote the Hibiki arc that I thought was fantastic. He was kept as the main writer for that and episode 26 onward. As I've been saying, I don't mind the arcs with the writer worlds. It's the arcs after that I have more of a problem with. That's where the quality dipped and I wasn't enjoying the show anymore. It got stale and dull. I don't mean to point the finger towards Yonemura, but he was the head writer for that until the final episode. Yes, that includes All Riders vs. Die Shocker and The Last Story. One of the biggest issues of Decade is that it ended on a cliffhanger. It wasn't just the fans that didn't like the ending either. It was so out of hand that TV Asahi went under investigation by the BPO, the Broadcast Ethics and Program Improvement Organization of Japan. The BPO deemed Decade's ending to not be an appropriate technique to announce a movie with no clear end goal after the series finale. Maybe Toei didn't have the resources to make a proper ending. Decade and Double were being worked on simultaneously, pre-production and all. Plus, Decade is a short season, only 31 episodes. That's a lot of planning for 49 episodes of Double along with this season. Not to mention that Bandai were the ones who wanted a shorter season in order for them to market Ryder and Sentai toys at different parts of the year. Yeah, a lot was riding on Toei making two seasons practically side by side and having the main writer leave almost immediately. Captain Obvious here stating that making a TV show isn't easy. There are bound to be huge production troubles no matter what. Decade just so happened to have one of the unluckiest seasons to have almost everything go wrong. Most fans would point towards a specific trailer to show just how messed up the production was. Some of you might already know what it is, as it's considered a huge mystery within the fan base. <laughs> this trailer was shown immediately following the final episode. A trailer for the supposed true ending of Decade. But is that really true? Was there really an original ending in mind that would have tied everything together? No. There wasn't. Sukasa's actor, Masahiro Inoue, stated in an interview in the Blu-ray release that this trailer was filmed alongside the final episode, meaning that there wasn't a finished script for the movie or otherwise. Just ideas. These scenes were made specifically for the trailer, and nothing more. 
they were put into the director's cut of the last story, but as a dream sequence. He went on to say that the final script didn't say final episode like it was supposed to. As much as I and so many others want to believe that Decade was planned to be a lot more, it simply wasn't. It fell under unfortunate circumstances where things were almost literally made as they went along. I guess you could say the ideas were the original ending, but that's as true of an ending as me saying that one of the plans for Decade was to make it a Dano season 2. Sure, someone officially stated that the idea was thrown around, but that's obviously not what happened and didn't even make it to the cutting room floor. If you want more concrete evidence, producer Shirakura, one of the highest higher ups you can get, himself said it was done intentionally as the official ending. He wanted a different ending than what we normally get. Either way, he thought it was appropriate as he wanted to build up hype for the next season, Kamen Rider Double. Yeah, I'm sure Akaiwa had an ending in mind too, but again again, he left about halfway into the show and clearly Toei didn't have one planned, so they just filmed random ideas for a last minute trailer. Unless Yonemura pops up with a script labeled Decade Ending 2009, the last story is as original an ending as we have. This trailer was nothing more than random scenes for ideas. In a lot of ways, we really should be saying Onore Double, but a lot of it goes back to Toei, too. Is it weird that I found the production issues more interesting than the show itself? <laughs> We've come this far, huh? 10 years of Heisei Phase 1, and we end with a never-ending journey. I feel like I've talked more than enough about Decade. I can only say that it's enjoyable so many times. In fact, I think I can sum up my final thoughts with a single sentence. Kamen Rider Decade is a mess, but a fun mess. With all that being said, I'll see you guys next time as we take a look back one last time with an overview in History of Heisei Kamen Rider Phase 1. Hey guys, this is me unscripted. I just want to say thank you. Without you, we wouldn't be here. Common Writer Decade, History of Common Writer. 10 of them. 11 if you want to count Dragon Knight, more if you want to count the others, but we're finally here and there's still more to go. So thank you so much. Honestly, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ooh.